comes in the clouds of glory. Praise God.
Valentine's is coming up real soon. But I just keep falling in love with Jesus. Let's we'll sing this song. I keep falling in love with him. And I keep falling in love with him. God. We went to offering at this time, and uh, in prayer, let's remember Brother Jim. He's not feeling real well today, so let's, uh, Jim, quick, let's let the Lord touch him. You want to pray over the offering? Jim? Thank you, Lord, for another day to be with the Lord. We ask that you touch him up, Lord. And also, Lord, please bless everyone that's here today. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs>
This time, Brother Gal will come and minister the word of God. It's good to be here. We come together and worship the Lord and thank him for what he's done for each and every one of us. Interesting title here is the thing 
was done suddenly. This is a wonderful five words that are in this scripture. We look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29, and we look at 2 Kings 18. They begin to revive things to each and every one of us. There's a letter written to a person. I think she died in 2002. But Ann Landers, we used to hear her and things that she would make up or to share with us. It was by this reader who signed in, not giving their name, but wrote Georgia, probably the place where he lived, who had lived through the Depression, and he had described how hard it was to be for a teenager in the 1930s, according to this man. And here's what he wrote. Kids today have an easy time of it compared to the teens in his day. Later on, a letter was written to this Georgia and signed it Indianapolis. As Land Anders returns and replies, wrote, you said I could not argue with Georgia. Well, and can. Let me ask you in your generation, a few questions he did. One of them was, is, are your parents divorced? Well, almost every one of your generations didn't come from a broken home. Wasn't your generation thinking about suicide when you were 12 years old? Did you have any ulcers when yours were 16? Did your best friends losing her virginity to a guy she went out with twice. You may have had a worry about BD, and, but you did have to worry about AIDS. He wrote on, did your classmates carry guns and knives to schools? How many kids in your class came to school regularly, drunk, stoned, or high on drugs? Did you or your friends have their brains fried from PCP? What about the percentage of your graduating class also? Graduate from a drug, alcohol, hab centers. Did your school have armed security guards in their halls? Did you ever live in a neighborhood where the sound of gunfire at night was normal? You can spend your time looking back and talk about being dirt poor you were. I won't spend my time looking back. I'll just thank God that we survived. And you know, do you think about it? Our kids did go through a lot. Not during the depression that it came upon. But everybody has different things that gets into them. And she signed it at the end, Indianapolis, to get back with what he had made. When you look in the Bible, you look at generations, and you see the different peoples that are there. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, in verses 3 and 4, it says, Uzziah was 16 years old when he became the king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. You take the next chapter in chapter 27, Jotham was 25 years old when he became a king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Although he did not enter the temple of the Lord like Uzziah did, and then later on he got that leprosy upon him, but still the people acted corrupt, corruptly. In the next chapter of 2 Chronicles chapter 28, it said Ahaz was 20 years old when he became a king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord at his, as his father David had done. For he had walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made molded images 
for the Baals, and that was a worship of the times of the other 10 tribes. It came to a particular point that we understand that sin literally is an abnormal condition, which leaves the flowers of the, uh, the, the flowers of the, his people in wilted condition, and we enter before God, and we understand that that's a time for us to come to him in a holy and up, upright way. Or if we don't, we'll be sinful and bent. There's no mid, this thing when you think about the standing of this and what people were thinking about and what they were trying to do. There's comes to a particular time that the acreage is given to a neutral stance or a detachment nor to a commitment, they rested with each of them as they realized a commitment for excellence that comes from Christ Jesus, and it must be done by a Holy Spirit that comes into all of our lives as we make that commitment. It's something that, as we found in that word, suddenly, which is talking about without hesitation or without reservation, it's coming to a point that a man changes and changes the nation. And so we see Hezekiah begins to rise. It's a time that he's the son of a very wicked man. His name was Ahaz. He took a lot of the things of the church and went to sell it to give it to people so that they wouldn't come and attack him. At the same time, as he done give away all the things of God's temple and the things that were in it, he was also then slain by those people after they took it, as well as they took the money that came that way. So Ahaz gathered the articles of the house of God, cut it in pieces, the articles of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. He made for himself these idle altars, however, in every corn of Jerusalem. It's as if Ahaz had made a pact against or with Satan and becoming part of it as he went against the, our God. And things begin to happen. We do not stand with God, then we're standing in the enemy. We may never go as far as to tear down the altars of the God that he had done, but neither of them do they come to a point that they visit the altars of God. When was the last time? When we come to a point of importance, we don't do, but the sin of omission is as great as the sin of commission. And the real question is, what are we going to do to building up the altars and causing them? We built these altars in this church. I made them one way. They're a little bit higher and they're bent and on side and the knees were in the way. And I thought that's not the best way to do. So we come in, we cut it and broke it apart again and put it back together to where that you can bring the knees to where they can come closer to the altar and we can pray and we can talk to our God and turn it over to him. And we need to have those buildings of the altars and the building of the idea that we need to come and bring it to God. In chapter 28 of Second Chronicles, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became a king. He, he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did what was uh, not doing right in the sight of the Lord, as his father David had done. For he walked in the ways of the kingdom of Israel, those 10 northern tribes, and made images for the bales and the trees and the places that they could come and gather in this falsity of the bail upon them. It tells us then in verses 3 and 4 that he is in, in the incense there, that on the valley of the son of Hinnon, it was the valley west and southwest of Jerusalem. And they burned up their children in fire in the Baal, and they would do so. And according to the abominations of the nations from the, whom the Lord and had cast upon the children of Israel, and he sacrificed and burned incenses on the high places, on the hills, and under the green trees. Literally, this is what Ahaz wanted you to do. Sometimes we wonder about who is going to run the places as governors or presidents or in positions or different things like that. Many times they have things that they don't give it to God. And they don't live it to God. 
And we need to do that. And sometimes I see some people go to church and they don't live the life that they really should live. It comes to a point that there was a point that said something had to come. There had to be an altar. It had to be a place where there could be prayer, a place where that you can come and talk to him. And suddenly we begin to see things begin to reveal themselves that Ahaz who had went out to say, don't come and come and do anything against us. Here's all the the wealth of the temple, and they brought it, and they sold it to them, but he never made his home. He was killed because they took it anyhow. He thought he was doing it, but he wasn't making it right with him or with God. So Hezekiah now begins to arise. When you understand that when he was born, somewhere during a time, they gave him a name Hezekiah, which means Jehovah is my strength. What's that mean? God is my strength. And he began to live upon that. He had a mother in his life that was married to Ahaz, and he probably had several, like David and like uh, Solomon had. They had several different ones that they had at that time. But there was one that was called A-B-I, and that's what they called her. And then they later realized that her real name was Abijah that part of Jah, it was talking about God, that he's there with them, which her name meant was Jehovah is my father. It was at this time that their father had a son like Hezekiah, but he had a mother said, you're not going to take him to the bales and burn him in a fire. You're not going to do that to my children. She protected him and kept him and began to talk to him about who she was, Jehovah. The is my father. It's at this time that you begin to think about Ahaz and Hezekiah. They were not father like son. They were totally different. One was very bad and with bad things, but you had that wonderful young boy that was growing up with a mother that was protecting him and taking care over them. It came to a point that Ahaz was a rebel against God, but Hezekiah. He's a God-fearing man. He believes in God. And why was the difference that he was different? Now, was it his mother, Abijah, who lived on the meanings of her name, Jehovah, my father? Or was it a cousin? You know who the cousin was? His name is called Isaiah. He begins to minister to him. He had access upon the palace. And Isaiah instilled within Hezekiah the goodness and the faith of God. He began to know that something is different. And I want to tell you, the greatest thing that we have with our kids today is to know that God is in them and that God is with them and God is going to bless them and take care of them in the things that they go through. And we begin to see this story here that Hezekiah was at this time, things began to take place in his life and the influences that were going to fall upon him. One commentary stated this, It was Isaiah who had access to the throne, who knew Ahaz and wanted to do all in his power as a prophet to stop the reign of Ano through attacking Ahaz, and it did. By doing this greatest work in teaching the heir apparent of Hezekiah, something changed him. Don't you want to say, thank God I got some kids that grew up and they really loved the Lord? You know, our family, we always taught them to get close to God. We talked about how important the church was. And they've been part of the church at every church we ever went. When we went to Spokane and took a church from 25 people to 250 people, I went back and I counted them. And I thank God for 85 people they brought into that church came from the church from my children. And I thank God for it. God is a great big God that did all these different things. It shows us that when you work on the youth, you're going to make a better tomorrow. If you don't, Hitler worked on the youth of Germany. The communism worked on the youth of Russia. The cults are actively working on youth. Satanism, sexuality, humanism have uh, youth as the center of their goals. So what does it do? It comes to a point that somebody has to transfer the power of God. 
And the power of God comes into us and it passes out to our children and our children upon their Johnnies and, and the different ones that were in the group. And I thank God so many times what God has done. And now we see, what does it have to take Hezekiah? What did he do? He, he began at once. In 2 Chronicles 3, 29, he in the first year of his reign, and in the first month he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He did the job right then and there. And every four years, we as a people in January, we have a presidential elections that come forth every so many years apart from one another. And we have an inaugural uh, address that takes place. That Hezekiah, he is the 13th of the 20th kings of Judah. He's about to make an inaugural address. It's time to a point that it said that it was the first year, the first month. He said, we're going to do something. And Hezekiah expressed his desires to get through these things in his plies. Now, I have had 22 presidents since I've been born. Some of you are a little older than me. You've had a few more. Not too many because one guy was there for four terms and different things like that. But it came to that point that they come around with their campaign promises and they go through all the different things, the implements of what they want to happen in it and all these things that are going on. But what Hezekiah did was he opened the doors of the house of God. I haven't seen a president open the, the house of a door. I've never seen a governor do it. It's something that this one did. He was a king. And he said, let's open the doors of the church. Come to the times where you can worship him. And all of a sudden, the law of Ahaz had shut the doors, but Hezekiah, he opens them up immediately. He says, we're going into the house of God. And Hezekiah's words, it was being done. It's a time that the priests and the prophets of Baals were all around them. But suddenly Hezekiah rises up, says, I don't want to see that. We're not going to kill our kids no more because that's what they did. They went across it, and if they went through it, they were being offered to that God. My friend, it's when we give our children to God and ask God to bless our homes. What a great opportunity. Your children's sacrifices will no longer be accepted around to all these evil things. They come to a point that it's a kingdom and a kingdomship of a people that came together to where that they can love God and love God with all their lives, where that they freed up the access of the house of God and people were knowing that this is God's place. This is his holy place. It's a time for us to have the touch of God to come all upon us. Not only did he begin it once, he preached to the people. Here's what you need to see about a preacher and the way it ought to be. In the words of this king, Hezekiah, he is now both prophetic and he's priestly. He's coming to a point, and Hezekiah was now making the same. He comes to a point like Uzziah, his great-grandpa. He came to a point that he loved God, and Jotham, he was a man that loved God. But Ahaz was an evil, ugly person. He said, we got to change that particular thing. And it's not a, accepting himself. It's restoring things, the things that should be changed and come into our lives. And Hezekiah brought back the priests and the Levites. These are people that were not Baals. They were not doing the things that they were doing, but these people were coming up, and it's an old-time religion that's coming upon them. In chapter 29, verse 5, it said that the Levites consecrate yourselves now. And it said in 1 Peter 4, 17, it says, for the, son, for the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, there will be ungodly and the sinners appear. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good to a faithful creator. It's saying, we want to do that. 
I looked at two boys sitting here for a few moments and they were sitting there waiting for them to go and get out there. But it was there that they want to get in something that helps them and teaches them. I saw three of the, yours that went in there. I saw some more that came from back here. They went in. It's a thing that we understand that it's not only to adults, it's to young people just as much to come and find the power of God to come upon them. It comes to a point that there's a sanctifying that works out in our salvation with fear and trembling. There's a sanctifying, uh, sanctifying that takes place in yourself. But now it does not only sanctify in yourself, but it's now. It's got to be now. It's time for us to do it while they're young. It's while we can get a hold of them. And somehow God begins to do things. It's a day of salvation. It sanctifies then the house of God. Not only this place, but when they go home and you have better kids at your home, things begin to take place. In chapter 29, verse 6, it said, Our fathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him, talking about God, and have their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord. That's talking about the church and their backs on him. And they have also shut up the doors of the vestibule, but out of the lambs and have not burned incenses or burned uh, offerings in the holy places to the God of Israel. It comes to a point that revival is taking place. And what was happening in that day and time was that, that God was giving a power of God that can fall upon them. It's called a revival. How many remembers revival? Remember, anybody remembers revival? I think we all heard about revival. But revival, it's reviving. It's strengthening. It's good. It's things that have taken place. Children who changed their ways and their fathers. And the things took place. I remember going to church at seven o'clock on Sunday night. I remember never, ever getting out of church until 10 or 11 o'clock. We went to church for revival. See, it's something about getting a touch, a touch that God has given to us. I don't think, I'm not trying to say the strength of doing that. I sometimes as a child, I was upset. I never got to see the milky, uh, the, what's it called? Uh, the, those Disney kids that were on TV. I never, huh? Okay, I never got to watch them. But I want to tell you, my friend, we went there. Did we flunk a few things? Did we not get our homework done? No, we got it done. And we graduated and we done it good. And what the things of God. What I'm trying to say is sometimes I remember the altars. I remember as a boy going up to the church. And I'd have mothers that would sit there and pray for me for hours at a time and praying for me and the things that I needed God to come into my heart. It's something that had an impact upon them. And every one of you have been kids that have grown where I grew up. And I pray that somehow, some way, it has its effect upon those that are around you and us as we got children today, understanding that God is there for us. In 2 Chronicles 29, verse 8, it said, Therefore the wrath of the Lord fell upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has given them up to trouble, to desolation, and to jeering, as you see your eyes. For indeed, because of this, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons, our daughters, our wives are in captivity. And now it's my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Hezekiah, he came to a point. He said, I'm making a promise for God. We're going to open the door. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to come together in worship. And maybe it's a time that these words that King David understood that it was important to build this temple. He could not do it because he had some bad thing inside of him. But Solomon came along and they built it. And many people would come to this particular place and it came to a point of worship and praise when they came to him. In Psalms chapter 51, verse 17, it says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And these, O God, you will not despise. 
And Hezekiah, he says, we cannot allow our children to die the way they were doing before. I've got some brothers that were related to me that, that Ahaz had done it to his own son. But he turns around, he says, we're going to change it. We're going to do it. We're going to believe that only what God can do. So he begins it once. He preaches to the people. And then he comes to the point of the response of the people was upon him. He said, I can't do it by myself. So he gets the Levites to arise. The Levites were the people of God. Uh, the Lord had given them an inheritance. The Gershonites, the Kohanites, and the Maronites. All of these are the three sons of Levi. And then came the Elishapon, the chief of the Kohanites that kept uh, keeping the ark up and keeping it together. The Apsets, the Hermon, and the Hotrons, the, they came with their singing and their music to the Lord. What can I do for God? Can I do anything for him that's going to count? And then we see in verse 15, they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and went according to the commandments of the king and all the words of the Lord to the cleanse of the house of the Lord. So they're beginning now to clean it up. Make sure it stays that particular way. And then we go through the different things that it takes. Then we go to the, the valleys and the walls of Jerusalem. They realize that it's time for them to come to this point, And they would come to worship God and come because their hearts were in it. In verse 16, then the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, brought out all the debris that they found in the temple of the Lord to the court of the house of the Lord. The Levites took it out and carried it to the book, the brook of Kidron. I'll tell you about that one a little bit later. It's not as pretty as you might think it is. In verse 17 is how they began to sanctify on the first day of the first month and on the eighth day of the month. They came to the vestibule of the Lord. They sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And on the 16th day, on the first month, they finished. And Kidron is at a point that the walls and the temples, they were somewhere outside of it. It's a place that Jesus and his disciples, and uh, they had it a time where they gathered together and they were making it a holy place. And... Uh, if you go past the cross, the Kidron, my friend, it's uh, near the Garden of Gethsemane. You know where that was, don't you? That's where Jesus went. You know that Jesus spent the night in prayer near Kidron. And maybe it was something, just a place. But somehow or another, it was a place that was to be sanctified. It was all unclean things around it is a sewage is what it was. But it was a place that Jesus went to. You say, why did he do it? Because this is where he had to be, where he's going to be arrested. He's going to be sacrificed. And it's at this particular time that's going on in Hezekiah. They're coming to it. They're cleansing it up. In verse 18, they went to King Hezekiah and said, we have cleansed up all the house of the Lord and the altar, the burnt offerings and all its articles, the troubles of the showbread and all its articles. Moreover, all the articles which King Ahaz in his reign had uh, cast aside in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified and they are before God, the Lord, and know that he's there. Suddenly the power begins to fall upon them in this Kidron that is about to take place. And I'll tell you more about what happened there. It was one of the greatest things that ever happened when they said, we're not going to let our enemies come up to get that, that well down there and get water from it. So they sealed it up and they dug underneath all this area in, in just a short period of time. And they brought it to a place where they had the waters to come into it, where that they would have it. And there's a place called Siloam. It came to a point, it was a healing place. It was a power of God. All because a son said, we're going to take care of these things. He rose up and he assembles the princes of the city. The cabinet makers get to get there, together there. The princes there, 
the nephews, the nieces were commanded to come to church. They were commanded to come and, and come before God. Why? It's because worship service, it needs to take place. And they took up this offering in verse 21 there, that there was seven bulls, seven lambs, and seven goats. In verses 31 and 32, there's a thanks offering of 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 lambs. If you look at verse 33, there's 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep that are being liberated at this time. In verse 34, the Levites were of delicate up, uh, uprightness uh, and understanding that this is what God wanted them to do. And here's what the word that is used constantly, they, they, and they. It just keeps going and showing to us and suddenly you realize something was happening. Was it not the Pentecostal burning in the time of when they came to the place on the day of Pentecost? Was it not that the God came to come to a point to cause a cause to come to pass? And then in chapter 29, it says in verse 25, it said in Hezekiah, he uh, stationed the Levites at the house of the Lord with cymbals, stringed instruments, and with arps, and according to the commandments of David of God. The king seared Nathan the prophet, and those are the commandments of the Lord by his past. Have you not noticed in our church that we have what I call my big size bongos back there? How we need someone to play them and make a noise unto the glory of God. Would it hurt us to take that instrument and say, I want you to get someone inside this church. One time we had a guy in this church that was about six foot four tall, and he turned around and he would play him. And we had somebody, but we just need someone that will just take it to the glory of God. It takes it when our pianos was empty for so long and Desi was playing on this side. It was a place where we said, let's do something. It comes to that point that we understand that God says to us to do something. And then all of a sudden, after the Levites stood with the instruments of God and the priests and the trumpets, suddenly in verse 27, the song of the Lord. What that, does that mean? It means you and me. We can't play no tools. We can't take any instrument. We can't do anything. But my friend, I sang there this morning. We all sang. We want to worship. We want to glorify God. And then in verse 28, all the assembled together, the worship, the singers sing, the trumpets sounded, and it continued, and the burnt offering was finished. In verse 29, and when they had finished over the king and all those that were present with him bowed in worship, and this verse had something that was something that come, and it worship, and it's, there's a guy standing there just as happy as can be, and I believe his name is Hezekiah. He's getting really happy about his cousins, and everybody else are now worshiping the Lord. And everybody is giving all things to God. In verse 30, it said, Moreover, King Hezekiah and the leaders commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads in worship. Now, can I tell you the cost of that in day's time, what took place? was $370,000 in today's time. If you put it all together, and the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. It's not just a time in chapter 30, verse 1. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, these other 10 and 12 tribes, he wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, two tribes, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. Go out there and tell somebody out there, come on in, come on in. It's going to take us to do it. For the king and his leaders and all the assembles in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. In verse 5, it said, and send messengers to the northern tribes, come to keep the Passover with us. The other day, your son come and wanted to sell some candy. Guess what? He's got some buddies. <laughs> they came right behind him. It's just, what are we going to do? 
and then in verse 11, it said, nevertheless, I want you to reach out to Asher, Manasseh, Zebulun, humble himself to come to Jerusalem. All like Nehemiah, they wanted to clean it up. And if you look at the story of Nehemiah, it's, it, these are the two greatest revivals in all of Israel was taking place in Hezekiah and Nehemiah, a governor, was sent by an Arab <laughs> to go down there and you tell them what to do, clean it up. But this time it wasn't getting the church because they already built that with Ezra. He now turns around. He's got some groups together and it takes it to the point that he said, we need to build the walls of our cities and the gates. See, real God-filled people are going to reach those that are around us. I have preached this sermon so many times in my life. And we need to have that kind of revival in our church. Everywhere I go with, I think this is the greatest story there is other than Nehemiah that's just as good of what God wants to do. For suddenly, the thing was done. Suddenly. There's my theory for this one. I went on the, the internet and I found me a dove. And I wrote down, Dub, guess where I found it? It's that soap that you ladies like. And it turned around. There was that little Dub. It was turned the opposite way. And I turned him around. And down below it, there was writing that said, church is like this. <laughs> he said, let's have revival. Let's have revival. And I put that on that piece of paper and I found it cloudy and stuff like that. And I put it up there and I put that up on top of it. It wasn't together. I put it together and I realized that the next th three weeks, I want to talk to you about Hezekiah's revival. And then I want you to understand this one is the thing was done suddenly. If you look at it, it's get it done, get it done, get it done. And I come to that point and I was saying, church, we can do it. We took this church when I came here. It was 13 people. Within four months, we were running 85 people at one time. All we did is said everybody had to fill a pew. If you'll fill it, each one of you do it, we'll fill this thing up. It's coming to that point. But you know, the bad thing is we got that bad sickness, and it is a very bad sickness that's around. There's a lot of things of the diseases and the things that are there. And there's things like that. But I want to tell you, there's also a God that cares. And it comes to a point that we say, God, we need revival. And we need as only God can give it to us if we'll just let him do it. There's some things that have to be changed in us. And that's next week. There's a lot of things in your lives. Tell me you don't. We all need something special. It was so nice. Your son was so nice and smiling, smelling, and getting ready to sell those things. And I can't eat it because of my diabetes. You know what my feet feel like every day of my life? You got diabetes? Anybody here? You ever see those things on the streets or on the sidewalks that's got those yellow things on it? You know what I'm talking about? That's what my feet feel like every day because of that pain. I stand on it. And I feel like I'm standing on those little yellow things. It ain't funny. It ain't nothing I like. But you know, I want to tell you, there's a healing God that cares for us. And if I listen and do what I need to do, I can protect myself. I did not eat one of your son's candy. But Desi's sure having herself a time. Amen.
But my friends, can we give them something better than candy too? Can we give them, I like this church. I like that people. I like that guy. And all those things. Give us revival. Amen. Can you tell, tell me that's one of the greatest things that I can ever preach on is this story. And tell you what God wants to do. It's my favorite. It's my favorite of all of them. Because I know Hezekiah just said, get my nephews. Hey, bud, you're going to church this week. You're going to. Get your, yeah, get, get, get your aunt. Get, the, get, get all of them. You know, make a difference. Get someone to play that bongo. Get something that this church will be something special for God. On our list right now, we have now grown to 3,000, or 300 people are watching this church right now. I don't know where they are. I don't know who they is. I can't find anything. But I know that they're there. Just keep on doing it, doing it, doing it for God. Father, we bow ourselves before you. And we ask you, Lord, to help us, Lord. There's such a great thing in our lives. And the time is short that it's time for us to be like Hezekiah. Let's get up. Let's do it now, right now. Let's do what we can, everything. Sing, play instruments, do all you can. Always let the goodness of God rest upon you in everywhere you go. In Jesus Christ's most holy name, we seek you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Next few weeks.